Here, Mahamati, the Tathagatas employ two kinds of powers for the support of bodhisattvas who come before them for instruction. And which two supporting powers? The power to appear in bodily form and speak to those in samadhi and the power to anoint their foreheads. Mahamati, by relying on these powers of the Buddhas, bodhisattvas at the initial bodhisattva stage enter what is known as the light of the Mahayana Samadhi. Once they enter this Samadhi, Buddhas from worlds throughout the ten directions appear in bodily form and speak to them by means of these powers. As they did to Vajragarbha Bodhisattva and to other bodhisattvas of similar virtue and accomplishment. Mahamati the power of the samadhi attained by these bodhisattvas at the initial bodhisattva stage is a result of the good roots they have cultivated and accumulated over the course of a hundred thousand kalpas, as they work their way through the easy and difficult aspects of the various stages. They finally reach the dharma cloud stage, where they dwell inside a magnificent lotus flower palace seated upon a jeweled lotus flower throne surrounded by a retinue of their fellow bodhisattvas adorned with necklaces of jewels that shine like the sun or moon or golden champaka flowers. The great victors of the ten directions then appear before their thrones in this lotus flower palace and anoint their foreheads. Just as chakra or a chakravartin might anoint the forehead of a crown prince. This is what is meant by the power to anoint the foreheads of bodhisattvas. Mahamati, this is what is meant by the two powers that support bodhisattvas. Bodhisattvas who rely on these two powers will meet the Tathagatas. Otherwise, they will not. Moreover, Mahamati, all the special abilities of bodhisattvas regarding samadhi and teaching depend on these two powers of the Tathagatas. Mahamati, if bodhisattvas could teach without the supporting powers of the Tathagatas, fools could do so too. And why don't they? Because they aren't supported by these powers. Mahamati, when Tathagatas enter a city, due to their great powers, music comes forth spontaneously from instruments as well as from hills and rocks and trees and from city walls and palaces. Not to mention from sentient beings, as those who are deaf, blind, and mute are liberated from countless forms of suffering. Such are the limitless powers of the Tathagatas to help others. Mahamati then asked the Buddha. Bhagavan, why do the Tathagatas, the Arhats, the fully enlightened ones bestow their powers of support when bodhisattvas are in samadhi and anoint their foreheads during the higher stages? The Buddha replied. Mahamati. The Tathagatas. The Arhats. The fully enlightened ones use their powers to support bodhisattvas so that they are not troubled by demons and do not fall into the trances of shravakas and so that they will attain the personal realization of the Tathagata stage and so that their attainments will increase. If they did not use their powers to support them, they might fall prey to the misconceptions and projections of followers of other paths or to the longings of shravakas and demons and not attain unexcelled, perfect enlightenment. Therefore, all Tathagatas use their powers to protect bodhisattvas. The Buddha then repeated the meaning of this in verse. Dot. The noblest of those with higher powers. Vow to purify everyone. Their samadhis and their foreheads. From the initial stage to the tenth. 41. Mahamati again asked the Buddha, Bhagavan, when the Buddha speaks of dependent origination, he speaks of causes and conditions and does not speak of a self. Bhagavan, followers of other paths also speak of causes and conditions, namely, that whatever exists arises as a result of a supreme deity or force, or time, or minute particles. When the Bhagavan says whatever exists arises as a result of causes and conditions, is his position the same or different? Bhagavan, followers of other paths say what exists comes from what exists or what does not exist, while the Bhagavan says what exists comes from what does not exist, and once it arises, it ceases. According to the Bhagavan, ignorance is the condition of memory and so on up to old age and death. But this, Bhagavan, is a teaching of no causes, not a teaching of causes. The teaching established by the Bhagavan goes like this. 
because this exists, that exists. It does not acknowledge a gradual existence. The teaching of other schools would appear to be superior, not that of the Tathagata. And how so? Because according to other schools, Bhagavan, the cause does not arise from conditions but gives rise to what exists. Whereas the Bhagavan says the effect is discernible in the cause, and the cause is discernible in the effect, which confuses causes and conditions and which thus forms an endless circle. The Buddha told Mahamati, I do not teach that there are no causes. Nor do I confuse causes and conditions. Rather, because this exists, that exists, the non-existence of what grasps and what is grasped, and the awareness that these are nothing but perceptions of one's own mind. Mahamati. As long as people cling to what grasps or what is grasped and are unaware that these are nothing but perceptions of their own mind. It is they who mistake the existence or non-existence of external objects, not my teaching of dependent origination. I have always taught that things arise due to the conjunction of causes and conditions not that they arise without a cause. 42. Mahamati once more asked the Buddha, Bhagavan, is it not because words exist that things exist? Bhagavan, if nothing existed, words would not arise. Therefore, Bhagavan, it is because words exist that things exist. The Buddha told Mahamati, words are created even when things don't exist. Among the words that appear nowadays are, rabbit horns, and, tortoise hair. Mahamati, these do not exist and do not not exist. They are merely words. Your contention that because words exist things exist is faulty. Nor, Mahamati, do words exist in every world. Words are simply fabrications. In other Buddha lands, the Dharma is expressed by staring or by facial expressions. Or by lifting the eyebrows, or by blinking the eyes, or by smiling, or by opening the mouth, or by clearing the throat, or by thinking about something, or by nodding. For example, Mahamati. In the worlds of unblinking eyes are gathered fragrances or in the land of Samadabhadra Tathagata. A simple stare enables bodhisattvas to attain the forbearance of non-arising and incomparable samadhis. Therefore, the existence of words does not mean the existence of things. Mahamati, in this world such creatures as mosquitoes and gnats and ants and bugs all conduct their lives without words. The Buddha then repeated the meaning of this in verse. Dot. Just as space or rabbit horns. Or a barren woman's child. Do not exist except as words. Such are the projections of existence. Where causes and conditions meet. Fools give rise to projections. Unable to fathom what is real. They wander through the inn of three realms. 43. Mahamati Bodhisattva then asked the Buddha, Bhagavan, why is speech said to be eternal? The Buddha told Mahamati, because of delusion. Delusions also appear to the wise, but they aren't confused by them. Mahamati, such things as shimmering mirages, firebrands, strands of hair, cities of Gandharvas, illusions, dreams, and reflections confuse worldly people, but not the wise. It is not that these don't appear, Mahamati. All kinds of delusions appear, but it is not the case that delusions are not eternal. And how so? Because they neither exist nor do not exist. And how is it, Mahamati, that delusions neither exist nor do not exist? Because the realms of foolish beings are different. For example, because Pratas see and do not see the Ganges, it does not exist as a delusion. But because it appears to others, it does not not exist. Likewise, the wise are neither confused nor not confused by delusions. Thus, because their characteristics are not destroyed, delusions are eternal. Mahamati, it is not the different characteristics of delusions but the characteristics of projections that are destroyed. Thus, delusions are eternal. And how is it, Mahamati, that delusions are real? For the reason that the wise do not give rise to the thought of being confused or the thought of not being confused by a delusion. Not only the wise, Mahamati, 
but if anyone gives rise to the slightest perception of a delusion, it does not qualify as Buddha knowledge. Mahamati, anything about its existence is the mistaken talk of fools and not the talk of the wise. Whether delusions are imagined as confusion or not, they give rise to two lineages. The lineage of fools and the lineage of the wise, with the lineage of the wise being further divided among a Shravaka path, a Pratyeka Buddha path, and a Buddha path. And how do the projections of the ignorant give rise to membership in the Shravaka path? Membership in the Shravaka path is the result of attachment to individual and shared characteristics. This is how projections give rise to membership in the Shravaka path. Mahamati. As for how the projections of delusion give rise to membership in the Pratyeka Buddha path. Membership in the Pratyeka Buddha path is the result of attachment to aversion to the individual and shared characteristics of delusions. And as for the wise. And how delusions give rise to membership in the Buddha path. Membership in the Buddha path is the result of the awareness of perceptions as nothing but one's own mind, of external existence as non-existent, and of the non-projection of characteristics. This is how delusions give rise to membership in the Buddha path. Meanwhile, when people misperceive the existence of different objects, this gives rise to membership in the lineage of fools. Maintaining that this object does not exist or that object does not not exist, this is what is meant by this lineage. But when delusions are not projected, Mahamati, the wise are able to transform the existence of the habit energy of the mind, the will and consciousness, the modes of reality, and the dharmas into what is called suchness. Thus is it said, suchness is the mind set free. And to make it clearer, I say, to be free of projections means to be free of all projections. Mahamati asked the Buddha, Bhagavan, do delusions exist or not? The Buddha told Mahamati, they are like illusions. There is nothing to grasp. If a delusion had something that could be grasped, the existence of grasping would never cease, and dependent origination would amount to creation by causes and conditions, as claimed by followers of other paths. Mahamati asked the Buddha, if a delusion is like an illusion, can it serve as the cause of other delusions? The Buddha told Mahamati, an illusion is not the cause of a delusion because it does not give rise to misperception. Mahamati, an illusion does not give rise to misperception because it does not involve projection. Mahamati, illusions are produced by magic and not by the habit energy of projections or misperceptions. Thus, they do not give rise to misperception. Mahamati, it is the minds of fools that become attached to delusions, not those of the wise. The Buddha then repeated the meaning of this in verse. Dot. The wise don't see delusions with anything real inside them. If there was something real inside, delusions would be real. If delusions are abandoned, and something should appear, it would be another delusion. A defect like a cataract. 44. Moreover, Mahamati, in viewing everything as an illusion, if not for illusions, there would be nothing to compare things to. Mahamati said, Bhagavan, do you say things are illusory because of attachment to illusory characteristics or because of attachment to something else? If everything that exists was illusory because of attachment to different illusory characteristics, Bhagavan, something would exist that wasn't illusory. And how so? Because the different characteristics of a form have no cause. Bhagavan, it is the appearance of the different uncaused characteristics of a form that is illusory. Therefore, Bhagavan, it isn't attachment to different illusory characteristics that makes things seem illusory. The Buddha told Mahamati, it isn't because of attachment to different illusory characteristics that makes everything seem illusory. Rather, Mahamati, it is because everything is unreal and vanishes as fast as lightning. This is why it is illusory. Like lightning, Mahamati, it appears but for a moment and as soon as it appears, it disappears. 
But this is not how things appear to foolish people, who observe everything in terms of the individual and shared characteristics of their own projections. Since what doesn't exist doesn't appear, they remain attached to the characteristics of form. The Buddha then repeated the meaning of this in verse. Dot. If not an illusion what are things like? Thus are they called illusory. Unreal and transient is lightning. Thus are they called illusory. 45. Mahamati once more asked the Buddha, according to the Bhagavan, everything is non-arising and illusory. But when he says what is non-arising is illusory, is there not a contradiction in the Bhagavan's earlier and later statements? The Buddha told Mahamati, it is not true that when I say what is non-arising is illusory there is a contradiction in my earlier and later statements. And why not? Because what arises does not arise. When you realize that whether something exists or not is nothing but the perception of your own mind, its external existence is seen as non-existent and non-arising. Mahamati, there is no contradiction in my earlier and later statements. However, it is to refute the arising from causes of other schools that I say everything is non-arising. Mahamati, the confused members of other schools maintain the arising of existence or non-existence and deny that they are the result of attachment to their own projections. Mahamati, because I deny the arising of existence or non-existence, I teach the teaching of non-arising. Mahamati, I teach existence to refute the nihilistic view that nothing exists and so that my disciples will accept samsara, so that they will accept that where they are reborn involves differences in karma. Thus, I teach existence so that they will accept samsara. Mahamati, I teach the illusoriness of self-existence so that they will get free of self-existence. But due to erroneous views and hopes, foolish people are unaware that these are nothing but the perceptions of their own minds. To refute arising from causes and attachment to the self-existence of conditions and to prevent foolish people from clinging to erroneous views and hopes regarding what belongs to themselves in others and from creating mistaken doctrines about how to see things as they really are, I teach that the self-existence of everything is an illusion and a dream. Mahamati, to see things as they really are means to transcend what are nothing but perceptions of your own mind. The Buddha then repeated the meaning of this in verse. Dot. Non-arising means non-existence. Existence includes samsara. Who sees these as illusions? Doesn't give rise to projections of form. 46. Moreover, Mahamati, I will explain the characteristics of word, phrase, and letter units. For bodhisattvas who become adept at examining the characteristics of word, phrase, and letter units and at penetrating the meaning of word, phrase, and letter units will quickly attain unexcelled, perfect enlightenment. And once they are thus enlightened, they will enlighten others. Mahamati, as for a word unit, a word is established based on an object. This is what is meant by a word unit. As for a phrase unit, a phrase is a unit of meaning. It defines or determines the self-existence of something. This is what is meant by a phrase unit. As for a letter unit, it points to a word or phrase. This is what is meant by a letter unit. Moreover, a letter unit can be long or short, high or low. Also, a phrase unit is a footprint. For example, a footprint left by a person or by an animal like a horse or an elephant can be called a phrase unit. Mahamati, as for words and letters, we use words to refer to the four formless skandhas. Thus we speak of words. And we use letters to point to their individual characteristics. Thus we speak of letters. This is what is meant by word, phrase, and letter units and why I say distinguishing the characteristics of word, phrase, and letter units is something you all should cultivate. The Buddha then repeated the meaning of this in verse. Dot. Distinguish units of letters. Units of words and phrases. People who foolishly cling to these. Are like elephants in a quagmire. 47. 
Moreover, Mahamati, in future ages those who are wise might ask those who are not what I mean by, avoiding views characterized by sameness, difference, both, or neither. And they might answer, whether form and so on are permanent or not or whether they are different or not is not a proper question. Likewise, if they are asked to compare and contrast the characteristics of nirvana and samskara, characteristics and what is characterized, qualities and what is qualified, matter and what is made of matter, seeing and what is seen, earth and dust, practice and practitioner, they might answer, the Buddha has declared these to be unanswerable. But silence is something such foolish people would not understand. It is because those present lack sufficient wisdom that the Tathagatas, the Arhats, the fully enlightened ones say these are unanswerable to help them overcome fear. This is why they don't answer. Also, it is to put an end to the mistaken views of other paths that they don't respond. Mahamati, followers of other paths teach such unanswerable propositions as, life is identical to the body. Mahamati, this is because these followers of other paths are bewildered by causality. Unanswerable propositions are not what I teach. What I teach, Mahamati, is getting free of what grasps and what is grasped and not giving rise to projections. Why should I be silent? However, Mahamati, when someone is attached to what grasps or what is grasped and does not understand that these are nothing but perceptions of their own minds, then I am silent. Mahamati, the Tathagatas, the Arhats, the fully enlightened ones use four kinds of explanation to teach others. Mahamati, I invariably use silence with those whose roots are not yet mature, not with those whose roots are mature. 48. Moreover, Mahamati, whatever exists is neither created nor does it arise from causes. There is no creator. Hence whatever exists does not arise. And why, Mahamati, does whatever exists have no self-existence? Because in the light of personal realization, neither individual nor shared characteristics can be found. Thus, I say whatever exists does not arise. Mahamati, why is it that whatever exists cannot be grabbed or released? If you try to grab its individual or shared characteristics, there is nothing to grab. And if you try to release them, there is nothing to release. Thus, whatever exists cannot be grabbed or released. Mahamati, why is it that whatever exists does not cease to exist? Because no characteristics of its self-existence exist, whatever exists cannot be found. Thus, whatever exists does not cease to exist. Mahamati, how is it that whatever exists is impermanent? Because once a characteristic appears, its impermanence exists. This is why I say whatever exists is impermanent. And how is it, Mahamati, that whatever exists is permanent? Because once a characteristic appears, its non-arising exists. And because its impermanence is permanent, I say everything is permanent. The Buddha then repeated the meaning of this in verse. Dot. For refuting the views of other paths. I use four kinds of explanations. A direct answer or another question. Analysis or silence whether life exists or doesn't. For what is better left to silence? Vaisheshika and Samkhya masters present their explanations. Examined by correct knowledge, self-existence cannot be found. Because it transcends words, I teach no self-existence.